Okay, hey guys, and welcome to week two of the Vol State COM270 online course. Um, here's where we're at. Hopefully by now you guys have got the book, Audio Basics by Stanley Alton. Um, simple little book. You can, in fact, uh, buy an e-book as well, which is probably a pretty good complement to an online course, right? Um, hey, I'll tell you what, there's a reason why... I am sitting behind a drum set right now, okay? And that's because we are talking about the ear and how it works and how you screw it up, stuff like that. Where we are is chapter number two, which is called the ear and hearing. I'm gonna go ahead and read to you just a little bit of what's going on here at the beginning of the chapter, okay? Right off the first paragraph, it says, the human auditory system is one of the body's most complex and delicate systems. In general, when it functions normally, it transforms sound waves into a series of electrical impulses. When these impulses reach the auditory center of the brain, they are identified as sound. And this whole process happens within a split second. Okay? So, Think about that for a minute. In other words, these things right here in the side of our head are more or less the same as a microphone, right? In other words, in a microphone, sound, the acoustic pressure of a you know, sound wave smacking, you know, air molecule being forced into the next air molecule, what we talked about last week, hits the microphone and it is, as we say, transduced or converted into electricity. Guess what? Our ears do the same thing. They take the sound pressure in, SPL, right, which is decibels of sound pressure level, and they turn it into electricity. Cool? Which our brain interprets as sound. Okay. Pretty neat thing, huh? Our, our ears? Yep, just like a microphone. Cool, huh? That's actually why it is that cochlear implants can work and actually work pretty well because they're taking sort of the, uh, you know, the original equipment here, the God-given equipment, and replacing it with some man-made stuff, right? And it doesn't work altogether bad. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so, uh, so what I want you to think about here, the big picture, this chapter we're going to just whiz right through. And it's kind of boring stuff, so you can all go, woo, on that one. Um, we're not attempting to make, you know, ear surgeons out of you. I just want you to have a little bit of a basic understanding of hearing because I want you to know how fragile it is and how easily it can be damaged and to kind of put that together with the concept of, hey, look, if you're going to work in this music industry, you're going to need these things to be more than decorative when you're like 60 years old. You know what I mean? I mean, I know I'm going to need them, okay? And so here's the deal, man. I started playing professionally in bands at about age 13, and that's been a while ago, right? And I played guitar mostly in bands. I also spent a lot of my time flying airplanes for a hobby, which are also extremely loud. And just recently, I've actually started playing drums in a pretty hard rock band. So, you know, guitar, drums, airplanes, I'm doing everything in the world to like destroy my hearing. But so far I haven't, and we'll talk about why in just a little while, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about the ear. This is on page 12. There are some pictures here. Okay, small children, you might want to divert your eyes because this is pretty grody stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. Pictures of what the ear looks like inside, kind of all magnified and stuff like that. You don't need to know that. But I want to give you this sort of overview idea, right? So we've got the outer ear, the portion you can see, going into the inner ear canal, and, or, or the middle ear canal, and then into the outer eardrum, right? A little membrane that, that when the air pressure hits, it moves a little. And then there's these three little bones in there. They're shaped like a hammer, an anvil, and a stirrup, if anyone even remembers what anvils and stirrups look like, um, that serves as a mechanical amplifier to make what little motion starts on the outer eardrum even bigger by the time it gets to the inner eardrum, right? So in other words, that eardrum is moving to the air pressure that's hitting it. And then, right inside of that sets the auditory nerve with all of these little hairs, little microscopic hairs on it called cilia. And the idea is that when these little hairs wave in the pressure or the wind, if you will, caused by the eardrum moving, 
it creates a small electrical signal in that auditory nerve which your brain then interprets as sound. Okay? <clears throat> Delicate. Fragile. What does that mean? That means it can be screwed up really easy. Now, I will tell you that the smallest hairs that are the closest to the eardrum are, in fact, the ones responsible for hearing high frequencies. Remember why that is? Uh, last week we talked about the fact that low frequencies are these big, huge waves, right? You don't need a delicate little thing to, to, uh, to pick those up. But the high frequencies, remember they're tiny little itty bitty waves. I mean, we talked about the fact that a single sheet of paper can block high frequencies. So it requires some very delicate little hairs to be able to pick those up. So delicate that they can be damaged easily. And that's why if you start losing your hearing, chances are really good you will lose the high frequency portion of your hearing first. And what that means is you will be that old guy sitting there going, Maud, I can't understand the television. It's true, true, true. Sounds all muffled. Yeah, don't be that guy. Okay? So, what do we do then? If you're like me and you make a living out of making music, even playing loud drums in a rock and roll band, um, then your only choice is earplugs, okay? I have a couple of sets here. These are called Heroes. These are specially made actually for drummers to, to, um, to help with fast impact sounds and to still sound natural. And these are some extremely expensive custom molded things to my ears that are also considered hi-fi musician plugs. And I'm telling you, if you value your hearing, it's worth it, okay? Um, now, if all you're doing is mixing a band, or maybe you're on stage playing and you aren't singing, the little like 50 cent foam things that you just roll up and stick in your ears and they expand, do a great job and you'll probably find that you're just happy as can be with them, okay? Um, if you're if you're having to sing in a band though, that, that you know, if you just plug your ears <laughs> and hear what it sounds like when you hear your own voice, you'll understand you can't sing like that very well. So um, you're going to have to get some good earplugs. Or a lot of the industry these days is going to the in-ear monitors, right? Which not only work like headphones to feed, you know, whatever you want to listen to back into your ears, but they also do a great job of blocking sound outside. So as long as you're careful with your volume control, they're both giving you sound and protecting you from sound all at the same time. Pretty cool, huh? So, there you go. So basically, you got two ways of saving your hearing. Way number one is just to avoid the loud sound in the first place. Not always possible if you're a musician, right? Number two, earplugs. Enough said? Okie doke. Hey, I want to mention this, by the way. Girls, genetically, you're not going to lose your hearing as early as guys. Hmm. That's what the facts say. Now, some people say it's not actually genetic. It's just the fact that men do more stupid stuff like flying airplanes and playing drums, and that's why we tend to lose our hearing first. Don't know for sure if that's the case or not, but guys, I'm talking to you. Be careful. Okay? Cool enough? Um, so let's talk about hearing loss, kind of stages, okay? We're on page 14 of our book right now, and I want to mention the fact that uh, the book does mention something called conductive hearing loss, right? And this is basically like when something happens, man, like rapid decompression in an airplane, or you, you know, you get blasted with the sound of a jet engine at 10 feet or whatever, and you literally are like blowing your ear out. I mean, you've like ripped and torn your eardrum or something like that. That's not going to happen in regular music very often, praise God, right? Um, but the next two things it talks about under sensorial hearing loss um, are the things that we have to deal with. First, let's just say that you've been listening pretty loud for a while, okay? And you notice that your ears just aren't as sensitive, especially to the high frequencies as they used to be, right? Um, that is called uh, temporary thresholds shift, TTS, okay? Temporary threshold shift. In the music industry, we used to call it, uh, in studios, cauliflower ears, right? This kind of sounds like you got a little cotton stuck in your ears. Um, good news, it's temporary, as the T in TTS means. It's just kind of a little warning sign. Your ears are just sitting there going, hey, man, I'm tired. <laughs> okay, give me a break. And you give them a break, and everything's okay. 
The next thing that happens is called tinnitus, and that is um, the ringing in the ears, okay? And here's the, the thing about tinnitus. First of all, I've got some buddies, musicians, have got, who've got bad tinnitus, and it goes from a simple ringing to ringing and squealing and hissing and buzzing and clanging and all kinds of noise that you just hear all the time that isn't really there. That sounds like something I want to avoid for sure, right? Um, and here's a weird thing, man. Uh, tinnitus, it may or may not be permanent, okay? By the way, I have the quiz here that you're going to be taking online. So you want to listen to what I'm saying, because some of this stuff is important, like what I'm saying right now, for instance. So tinnitus <laughs> may or may not be permanent. Um, most people, you know, you go out to hear a loud rock band for the first time, or two, or three, and later that day, or the next day, your ears are ringing a little bit. You might get by with it. Yeah, give it a day or two, and your ears pop back to normal, especially if you're young, right? And, you know, your whole body is just, like, more resilient and stuff like that. But see, here's the deal. At some point, it's going to go from being temporary to being permanent. And if you keep, you know, abusing your ears, it'll get progressively worse and worse and worse until you'll be like my buddy Doug and who has to sleep with a loud fan at night because all the buzzing and hissing and whizzing in his ears keeps him awake at night. Man, don't go there. Protect yourself from that. So again, the two ways that you're going to protect your ears, either avoidance if you can or earplugs. Cool? Good enough? Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about actual sound pressure levels as related to hearing loss. And this is the chart that is on page 16 of your book. It kind of talks about a few things um, and how loud they are, and it mentions that, you know, like in 40 to 60 decibels, we're talking acoustic you know, decibels in a room, which is SPL, decibels of sound pressure level, right? Hey, by the way, back in the day when I was first learning this stuff, I actually had to go and buy like a hundred dollar, you know, like nineteen eighty four dollars, hundred dollar meter to measure how loud things are. But now, if you have a smartphone, like an iPhone or an Android phone, you, ladies and gentlemen, can actually download your own app for that, right? So, I want to show you the couple that I've got on my iPhone here, and this will let you know how loud things are in your world, okay? So, um, the first one I have is just called DB Volume. Are you ready for it? Check that out. Pretty cool, huh? Very, very, very simple little meter that tells you how loud something is. Um, and it's very, very, very cool. Uh, by the way, it says it right now. What I'm talking is in the 70 decibels range, 74, 73. So that's kind of loud for talking. It's because mm, I'm talking kind of loud. Okay, I'm using my authoritative voice. Here's another one. Uh, this is called decibel tenth. Now this is neat, okay? Check this out. It's got that cool little uh, analog meter looking thing, and it also has up on the top this historical display that can tell you how loud things have been over time. Very cool meter as well. Problem with this one is, it when you, when you get into the really loud stuff, the like above 110 decibel stuff, it doesn't seem quite as accurate. Um, still though, no reason why you shouldn't have an SPL meter on your phone. As a matter of fact, for those of you in my 270 online class, here's what I want you to do. Download one of these apps on your phone, a decibel meter for your phone, right? And go around your house or your environment, your car, wherever you spend time with your ears um, and just make some notes about how loud the things are in your in your world, okay? How loud do you listen to music? How loud is your car? How loud do you watch television? Yeah, you know, how loud do your parents watch television? How loud do your kids watch television? Whatever, you know what I mean? Find out how loud the things are in your life, okay? And kind of make a note of some things that maybe surprise you a little bit, where you go, wow, man, I didn't really realize I listened to music that loud, or I didn't realize my car was that loud, or whatever, okay? Man, maybe my dad really is losing his hearing because, holy crap, is he listening to the television loud? That kind of stuff, okay? And then in our online discussion forum for this week, post your results, and let's talk about that. Because that's some good stuff, okay? Just getting you used to what it means when I say something is 60 decibels, which is kind of normal, quiet conversation, 
level. 70 decibels, which is what I'm talking now, kind of louder conversation, right? If you're looking in your book here, when you get into like 80, 90, 100 decibels, now we're talking loud vocals, subway station, this kind of thing, right? 110 decibels, we're talking electric guitars and amplifiers and drums, right? 120 decibels, now we are at the threshold of hearing loss. We're getting in that level where you can start losing your hearing from it. And guess what? Above that, at about 130 decibels, is the average volume of a rock band on stage or right up front. Okay? What does that mean? Yes, a concert is loud enough to ruin your hearing. So, bring your earplugs. Sound good? Here's the thing, man. I guarantee you, especially if you get a good pair of these musician earplugs, a concert will sound better with the earplugs in than without them. Because without them, it's just overloading your ears, right? And when you put the earplugs in, it drops it down by maybe 10, 15 dB. Then all of a sudden, your ears are operating in a range where they can actually function properly, and everything sounds better. It doesn't sound worse. It sounds better. So don't be afraid of the earplugs. And if the guy next to you says, oh, man, you're a wuss for putting his earplugs in, man, hey, let him think whatever he wants. Because he's going to be the dude sitting there going, Hey, Mullen, I can't hear the television! Right? He's going to be the guy going, Huh? When you can still hear. So there. Hmm. Last laugh. Yours. Um, so there you go. That's really all I wanted you to get from Chapter 2 about the ear and hearing. Delicate, sensitive, easily messed up, wear earplugs. Hearing loss, apart from that kind where you're literally, you know, something physical has destroyed your eardrum or something like that, the two things to watch out for, temporary threshold shift, probably temporary, and tinnitus, the ringing, buzzing, hissing, which might be temporary, or guess what, dude? It's like playing Russian roulette. It might not. Might be with you for the rest of your life. So stick away from that stuff. Okie doke. Um, so there you go. We are moving on into chapter three. So in chapter 3, it starts right out talking about the frequency spectrum, which, by the way, we hear frequency as pitch. Cool? Okay. And we remember that square that I told you we'd be going back to last week. Um, and it basically says the lowest frequencies we can hear are about 20 hertz. The highest frequencies we can hear are about 20,000 hertz, right? Now, those 20 hertz... Free, uh, waves uh, are big, huge. <coughs> By the way, there's an app that can tell you just how big the waveform is given a frequency. I'm going to run that one for you too because you're going to dig this. This my I, I hope this blows your mind the way it blows my mind because it's pretty mind blowing, quite honestly. Okay, the one I've got here is called Equivalence. A 60 hertz wave. Right, 60 hertz, that's like a good solid low frequency, that's like good kick drum frequency there, right? Has a wavelength of almost 19 feet. That means from one point of compression to the next point of compression, we're talking almost 20 feet for that wave to, as we say, fully excurt, right? Okay, so, so frequency or wavelength is the time it takes for that wave to complete one full cycle. In other words, one complete smack, bounce back, and the next smack. So low frequencies, man, we're talking, you know, things that can take 20, 30, 40 feet. That is huge. Up on the top end, let's get this from it. Highest frequencies we can hear, 20,000. So let's take uh, 20,000 here as our new, as our new, our brand new frequency. Are you ready? This is going to blow your mind, I guarantee it. Okay, that is approximately five hundredths of a foot. Let's change that to inches. That is approximately 
Um, 20,000 hertz is approximately six tenths of an inch. Okay? That's a tiny little wave right there, baby. Right? Okay, so let's talk now about that spread from the biggest waves down here, 20 hertz, to the littlest waves up here, 20,000 hertz. And by the way, yes, there are sounds that happen below that and above that. Um, it's just that our sensory system isn't really capable of hearing it, right? Dogs, bats can hear frequencies above what we can hear. We can feel frequencies below what we can hear. But we're going to assume, for the time being, that the audible spectrum, what our ears can hear and interpret to our brain, is about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Okay? So, the book talks now on 21 about splitting that up into like lows, mids, and highs. Okay? And what the book says is the first couple of octaves of sound at the bottom, which it says are from 20 hertz to 80 hertz, are what it calls low bass. In the music industry, a lot of people are going to call that sub bass, right? That is, in fact, the stuff that you need subwoofers for. You need big speakers to move that big volume of air, okay? That is the poo. Cheap systems with little speakers can't even reproduce those frequencies. Not even close. They don't even exist. Next, upper bass, which the book calls 80 hertz to 320 hertz, right? This is the land of lots of fundamental bass frequencies in like bass guitars, the low strings on a guitar, that kind of thing, right? Good, solid, low frequency band. Next, mid-range, which our book calls about 320 hertz up to about 2,560 hertz, which is the same as 2.5K, right? K means thousand. So, 2,500 hertz, 2.5K, same thing. That is, man, there's so much sound in the land of mid-range. All around our world, we are full of mid-range. That's the sound of noise. Man, that's that. It's doors clanging. It's just, it's everywhere. It's air conditioners. It's, you name it, it's there. Um, and in the recording studio world, we're always fighting too much mid-range, okay? Next comes upper mid-range from about 2.5K up to about 5K, okay? from 2,500 hertz up to about 5,000 hertz. Same thing as 2.5 to 5K. Got it? Um, that is the land of irritating noises. Those are the frequencies our ears are most sensitive to. Okay? As a matter of fact, if you go right over to page 23 in the book, you will see the Fletcher Munson, quote, equal loudness curves. It's these crazy things here. Okay? And... You can spend a little time looking at them, but what it comes down to is what they found out is that the human ears are, in fact, most sensitive to frequencies up to up around 2 to 4K, right? 2.5, 3K being the most irritating. These are fingernails scratching on a chalkboard. This is baby crying in the middle of the night. This is sirens wailing, right? These are the irritating frequencies. The reason they're so irritating is because they're the frequencies we're most sensitive to. Got me? Okay, and then finally the book calls it treble. I like to just call it highs or high frequencies. And that is the stuff above about 5K. Okay? This is the land of um, Right? It's the land of cymbals. It's the land of the upper harmonics on an acoustic guitar. It's the air that comes over top of a voice that sometimes makes one voice sound so much cooler than another because some voices don't have any of that, while others have ah, lots of it. And through artificial manipulation in the studio, we can bring out those upper harmonics in voices that don't have them already. It's one of the cool things we can do in the studio, right? Okay, so... Refresh your mind on that in the book on page 21, 22. Kind of understand, you know, sub-lows, lows, mids, upper mids, and highs. Kind of get that feeling for what those frequencies are and how they affect things, okay? Um, and uh, do, 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 do. page 23, I want to also mention one other thing. Look at, these, look at these Fletcher Munson curves on page 23. If you don't have your book, Google Fletcher Munson curves, and you'll find them all over the place. And what you will see is that not only are the human ears most sensitive up around 3K, but they also are not at all flat or linear. Our human ears don't, you know, they've got a crazy curve to what they hear the most of and the least of. And here's the deal. That varies based on how loud you're listening, okay? So if you're listening to music really loud, 
you will actually be hearing more low frequencies than what are really there because low frequencies are emphasized the most at loud listening levels. Quiz question. Okay, got that? Inversely, if you're listening extremely quietly, then you're not hearing as many low frequencies as are really there, right? Because you're just not moving enough air molecules to, to push those big low frequencies, okay? So here's what's important about that. That means that if you're in, I gotta be careful not to hit my pedals here, because you'll, you know. Okay, so what that means is if you're in the studio and you're listening really loud in the studio and then people out in the real world listen to your record and they don't listen to it as loud as you do, your record's gonna sound thin, right? Because you've listened to it and you've mixed it, you've made that record in a way that augments low frequencies more than what they're really there. Does that make sense? That's, you know, people do that all the time, man. Um, and, and, and that's not good, it's not good to do that. Okay, so, how loud do you wanna listen? Well, if you look at these charts, what you'll see is that even though, you know, the hearing response is not flat at any volume, it is closest to flat at about 80 to 90 decibels, right? Which again, you can check with your little decibel app. And what that means is that when you're mixing in a studio, you should probably be listening at somewhere in that 80, 85, 90 decibel range, okay? For two reasons. One, it is where your ears are closest to flat, where you can count on them the most, and it also happens to be where most people out in the real world who listen to music for pleasure, that's how loud they usually listen to their music at, about 80 to 90 decibels, right? So they're hearing it the same way you mixed it, the way you intended for it to be played back. Score, so now your record sounds out there in the real world the way you intended for it to sound, okay? So kind of keep that in mind. Um, okay, so we are now moving on to page 24. The book talk, talks about masking. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of that. It basically says, guess what? One sound can cover up another sound. You all knew that, didn't you? Guess what sounds like to cover up other sounds the most? Yes, low frequencies. M disturbing all that air, right? They can just cancel out other frequencies that get in their ways. But here is something I do want to talk about. On the bottom of page 24, it says timber, right? And get this, I'm gonna read this a little, okay? It says, for the purpose of illustration, sound is often depicted as a single wavy line. I even did it last week on that little drawing of mine. But actually, that would just be a pure test tone, right? A sine wave. Which, by the way, you can get test tone generator apps. Ha <laughs> ha, you should do it, seriously. Um, to get, you know, so you can play a 400 hertz cone and go, uh oh, now I know what 400 hertz is. Um, and etc. But here's the deal. In the real world, real sounds aren't pure and simple. They're what's called complex. Listen to when I hit this symbol, for instance. You ready? And I'm just hitting it with this little uh, <laughs> dry erase marker so it won't be terribly loud, but check this out, okay? Are you ready? So you probably heard the fact that, you know, the main sound of the symbol, which is kind of like, that note is in there, but do you hear the low frequency too? Do you hear the wash in the low frequencies? How about, do you hear the shimmer of high frequencies above it? Okay, well here's what our book says. It says most sound consists of several different frequencies that produce a complex waveform, right? And it says that some sounds are more complex than others. Honestly, what makes a good symbol sound better than a cheap symbol is that it has more complexness to its sound, right? Yeah? It's not like, you know, you bang on a, on a pot lid or something like that and it makes kind of like one note, but a good symbol man makes all kinds of notes. A, you know, $40,000 Martin D28 from, you know, 1940-something because of the aging of the wood and the, and the quality of the wood and the quality of the manufacturer and all that stuff produces this complex sound that is rich in upper harmonics and all this stuff compared to like a $69, you know, plywood guitar that you, that you buy today, right? That doesn't have all of that complexness to it. It's that complexity. It is that, that um, how does the book put it? Uh, do, 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 do. Harmonics are exact multiples of the fundamental and overtones, also known as uh, inharmonic or overtones, 
And basically, what it says, it is the presence of these harmonics, these overtones, in addition to the fundamental tone that make sounds different from one another, right? Like I said, that's what makes a good acoustic guitar sound better than a bad one. But guess what? That's also what makes a middle C played on a piano sound different than a middle C played on a, you know, whatever, a flute, right? Whole different set. It's the same note, it's the same fundamental tone, but one has, the piano, for instance, will have a whole different bunch of complex tones both below and above that fundamental tone. That's why we listen to it and go, oh, it sounds like a piano. Cool? You get that? Quiz question. You ought to get it. Um, okay, next thing we're going to talk about is spatial hearing. This is at the bottom of page 25. Ah. Okay, are you ready? So here's the deal. We localize sound. In other words, we can tell where sound is coming from based on two things. One is the intensity. In other words, the sound on this side is going to hit this ear harder than it's going to hit this ear, right? And vice versa. But guess what? A sound over here is also going to hit this ear before it hits this ear. Does that make sense to you? Right? And remember, sound, sound is this mechanical process of molecules smacking into molecules, and that's relatively slow. And it's easy for our brain to, to say, oh yeah, it hit this ear before it hit, hit this ear. We can interpret that stuff. Piece of cake. Right? Um, so in other words, if, if you are missing one ear, you know, just like if you were blind in one eye, you lose depth perception. Well, guess what, man? If you're deaf in one ear, you lose the ability to tell where sound is coming from. Okay? So those are the two ways we hear. That's called binaural hearing as opposed to stereo. Stereo is just left and right. Binaural is left and right plus the time component. Cool? So that's how we localize sound. Now, one interesting little um, piece of that is what's called the Haas effect, right? And what that basically says is, I'm going to go ahead and read this for you. When a sound is emitted in a sound reflectant space, that would be an average room that, do you hear the reflections in this room? Right? That's a sound reflectant space. What it says is that the direct sound will reach our ears first before it inter interacts with the other surfaces. The indirect sounds are reflected off of the surfaces, right? And it says, if these small echo delays arrive within a window of 1 to 30 milliseconds, in other words, less than 30 milliseconds, then the echo threshold, there are few perceptual reactions. Okay, that's our book saying it hard. Here's what it means. It means under like like 30 milliseconds, especially under say 20 milliseconds, our ears don't hear it as echo. If it's that short, you know, then our ears kind of hear something's going on, but they don't say, oh yeah, that's an echo. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Now, when it gets above about 50 milliseconds, then, whoo, baby, our ears will say, yes, that's an echo, right? I mean, if I delay something by 50 milliseconds, and I ask my wife, what was that? She'll go, uh, it's like a delay or something, right? Yeah, okay, sure. But if I only delay it by 20 milliseconds, and I ask my wife, what did I just do? She'll go, uh, I don't know. And so does everybody else out there. That's why, we'll talk about this when we talk about delays. That's why you can use that short delay, that like 20 millisecond delay, to sneak some effects in, some like mechanical doubling effects that will make a vocal sound big and cool and huge, but no one will know what you're doing, except maybe some other engineers out there that know the tricks, right? Yeah, it's the kind of thing, you turn it on the vocal and everybody goes, whoo, that sounds huge, man, but they have no idea what you did. And no one out in the real world is going to hear it, right? They'll just hear that the vocal is complex and interesting. So think about that, okay? Haas effect says below about 30 milliseconds, we don't really hear it as an echo, okay? And by the way, when it gets above about 50 milliseconds, quiz question, that's when we will definitely hear it as an echo. Okay, cool. Does that uh, kind of make sense to you all? Um, I am going to go by right now my little quiz, just to, and that's it. We're at the end of that chapter, so easy peasy, right? 
Um, nice quick stuff. I just want to make sure that I've covered all of these questions because these are the questions you will have on your online quiz. Um, how do we localize sound? Two ways. Do you know what they are? Um, which frequencies are the least directional or the hardest to localize? Man, I skipped that one, didn't I? I'm so glad I went back. Here's the deal. Guess what, baby? Those low frequencies, because of the fact that the wavelength is so long, right? In other words, if, if there's a low frequency over there, it hits this ear, but it's this big old huge wave, man. And for all practical purposes, our brain can't tell which ear it has hit first. And it can't even tell which one really it's hit the hardest because, I mean, it's excurting over 20 feet and our little head's only about eight and a half, nine inches from side to side, right? And what that means is all bets are off when it comes to trying to figure out where those really low frequencies are coming from. And guess what? That is why you can have 5.1 surround sound systems. Do you all know 5.1 means five speakers that are the left and right plus a center channel in front of you and two speakers that are left and right behind you? That's the five. And how many woofers? Yeah, baby, just one. Why can you get by with only one woofer? Because you can't tell where those low frequencies are coming from anyway, right? If you play like a mid-range or an upper frequency through those five satellite speakers, you know, and you put it on one and you ask anybody in the room, hey, where's it coming from? They can all point to the speaker and go right there. But man, if you were to put five subwoofers around your room and play like an 80 hertz tone through one of the subwoofers and then ask people, okay, which, which subwoofer is playing that? They go, uh... Uh, the, uh, oh, right? You can't tell. The only way you could maybe tell if it was loud enough and if there was stuff in the room that was vibrating, you know, you could hear, you know, the stuff vibrating that is nearest the woofer that's actually on, right? You couldn't actually hear the tone, but you could say, well, you know, the pencils are rattling on that desk over there, so I bet that's the one that's on. Okay? But get that. We can't localize really, really low frequencies. That's why in surround sound, you have little satellite speakers for the for the mid-range and the upper frequencies, but only one sub subwoofer for the very low frequencies. Okay? Um, sounds that reach the air within about how long of one another are actually perceived as coming from the same place, again because of the size of our head. Uh, which frequencies are we the most sensitive to? Do you remember that one? Yeah, it's a quiz question. Um, oh, if we're listening stupidly loud, we're probably hearing more of what frequencies than are really there? Hmm. Quiz question. Um, okay, the listening level where our ears are closest to flat, where we probably should mix our, you know, the, the volume as indicated by our little, you know, keep us honest decibel meters where we probably should be li listening in the studio. But how loud is that in decibels? Hmm. Quiz question. Uh, okay, after exposure to loud sounds, you kind of feel like you've got cauliflower ears, right? A little cotton in your ears. What is that? Is it permanent? No. How about ringing, buzzing, hissing? What's that? Is that permanent? And finally, what is it that allows us to tell one instrument from another? It's the addition of what? To the fundamental tone. Well, there you go. That's all we got, man. Easy peasy stuff, right? Uh, I will warn you, as this course goes on, the material gets a little harder, a little faster. Um, it also gets a lot more fun, though, okay? So, uh, you know, warning, speed bumps ahead, man. Put your safety belts on. It's going to be a fast and furious ride.